Dr. William Perkins, an outstanding preacher and theologian, made contributions to the Puritan movement despite the shortness of his life. He was in Martin, Warwickshire in 1558 and educated in Christ College, Cambridge. In his years, he had much scholarly ability, but his personal life was very sinful. He was devoted to the sin of drunkenness. And while he was walking through the town, he heard a woman say to her child, hold your tongue or I will give you to drunken Perkins yonder. And finding himself as a byword among the people, his conscience gripped him. And he became so deeply impressed by it that it was a first step to his conversion. Now, after his conversion, he being a very strong opponent of Calvinism and always kindly dealt with those in spiritual need. He became a fellow at the college in 1578 at the age of only 24. Perkins was later ordained and began ministry, preaching to prisoners in the Cambridge jail. He collected the prisoners in one spacious room where he preached to them every Sabbath with great power and great success. Here, the prison was his parish. His love to souls and the work of preaching itself were all the wages he received. Multitudes began to come to hear him from all quarters of the city. And by the blessing of God on his endeavors, he being the happy instrument of bringing many to the knowledge and to the glorious liberty of the sons of God, not only of the prisoners, but others who uh, were in similar captivity and bondage to sin, he preached the gospel. He had great fame, known in all the churches, was soon spreading through the whole university. And so he was chosen preacher at St. Andrew's Church, where he continued a laborious and long ministry for Jesus Christ. He is said to have encountered a young condemned prisoner who is terrified not so much of death as the impending judgment of God, but the Puritan preacher knelt beside him to, quote, show what the grace of God can do to strengthen thee. He showed him that Christ is the means of salvation by the grace of God and urged him with tears to believe in him and experience the remission of sins. The youth did so and was able to face his execution with composure. It was a glorious display of God's sovereign grace. And the incident should be kept in mind while studying Perkins' chart of election and reprobation. His chart shows his theology didn't make him cold and heartless with sinners in need of a savior. Around 1585, Perkins was chosen as rector of St. Andrews, Cambridge, and he continued there until his death in 1602. Being settled in this public situation, his hearers consisted of students from the college, townsmen, and people from the country. This required those particular ministerial endowments which Providence had richly bestowed on him in all of his discourses. His style and his subject were accommodated to the capacity of the common people, while at the same time, the pious scholars heard him with admiration. Luther, Martin Luther, said, those who simply preach the law and do not bring forth gospel and consolation are not wise master builders. They pull down, but they don't build up again. But Mr. Perkins' sermons, they were all law and all gospel. He was a rarity of those with the gifts in such an eminent degree in one preacher that even when he would simply thunder away to awaken sinners of the danger that they were in, he would drive them by persuasion from the thundering damnation that he would bring to the comfort of Barnabas, to pour the wine and the oil of the gospel consolation into their wounded spirits. He was a master at this. He used to apply the terrors of the law so directly to the consciences of his hearers that their hearts would often 
under that preaching when he would say damn as if they were being damned with an emphasis that it was like there was a doleful echo in their ears a very long time afterwards. Also, his wisdom in giving advice and comfort to troubled consciences is said that it was such that the afflicted in spirit could receive much comfort from his instructions. Mr. Perkins had a surprising talent for reading books. He perused them so speedily that they appeared as if to read nothing. And yet he read them so accurately that he seemed to have read everything. In addition to his frequent preaching and other ministerial duties, he wrote numerous excellent books, many of which on account of their great worth were translated into Latin and sent into foreign countries where they were greatly admired and esteemed. Some of them were translated into French, Dutch, and Spanish, and they were dispersed to the various European nations. Vodius and other foreign divines have spoken of him with great honor and esteem. Bishop Hall said he excelled in distinct judgment, a rare dexterity in clearing the obscure subtleties of the schools and in easy application of the most perplexed subjects. And yet with a simple application of some of the most difficult subjects. And though he was the author of so many books, being lame in his right hand, he wrote them all with his left. He used to write in the title of all of his books, Thou art a minister of the word, mind thy business. So this celebrated divine was thorough both in principle and practice and was more than once convened before his superiors for nonconformity. Yet, he was a man of peace and great moderation, and he was concerned for a pure reformation of the church and desired to promote that particular point. He also did not ascribe to the Book of Discipline, and complaint was brought against him many times and they wanted to kick him out of the church many times. However, as a result of his ministry and God's providence, he was able to stay in and minister to his flock. He taught many things out of many different subjects, giving a comprehensive understanding of what the scriptures were about. He spoke not only about salvation and damnation, but about the sweetness of Christ and the nature of the church. Mr. Perkins was so pious and exemplary in his life that malice itself was unable to reproach him. And his preaching was a just comment upon the text. So his practice was a just comment upon his preaching. And he was naturally and cheerfully pleasant rather reserved towards strangers, but familiar upon their further acquaintance. He was of middle stature, muddy complexion, bright hair. He was never idle. He was by all, says Fuller, a painful and faithful dispenser of the word of God, and his great piety procured him liberty in his ministry and respect to his person, even from those who differed from him in other matters. He is definitely classed among the fellows, the learned writers of Christ College, Cambridge. Churchton styles him the pious and Calvinistic Perkins, and Augustus Toplady applauds him on account of his Calvinistic opinions and denominates him as the learned, holy, and laborious Perkins. James Usher had the highest opinion of him and often expressed his wish to die just as holy Mr. Perkins did, who died crying for mercy and forgiveness. Herein he was indeed gratified, for his last words were, Lord, especially forgive my sins of omission. Now his individual writings consisted mainly of treatises on a variety of subjects, many of which Puritan publication has published updated modern versions, such as a treatise 
on man's imagination, which is on total depravity. A treatise of God's grace and man's free will, where he masterfully deals with showing God's sovereignty. A salve for a sick man, which expounds on how one should live in a godly manner during sickness and during their last days before they die. The foundation of the Christian religion gathered into six principles, which expounds the basics of the Christian faith in a short treatise. A plain treatise of the order of predestination, which is an excellent treatment of the will of God in election and reprobation. And one of his most famous works called The Order of the Causes of Salvation and Damnation, which treats who God is, how God works his decrees, and how people are saved and damned. He also has a very intriguing work called A Discourse on the Damned Art of Witchcraft, where he shows how Satan's influence can prompt people to enter into a league with Satan as a witch, knowingly, even how people unknowingly may come into a covenant with Satan through things like horoscopes, astrology, superstition, and other satanic influences. His writings, all very well received, very popular, and even after his death, they were translated into various languages scattered across the world and collected ultimately in three volumes called The Works of William Perkins. And Puritan Publications is continuing to publish these works knowing that they're some of the best written works penned in the English language. So take a moment and study a bit about Mr. William Perkins the Cambridge Divine and Puritan.